like I said, I'm really grateful for the chance to come here and share a little bit from God's Word this morning. So thanks, Dave, and the leadership team and so on. Um, this morning, I want to share, we can get this slide up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to share from a passage in uh, 2 Timothy, verses 1 to 10. So if you've got a Bible, you can open it with me if you'd like. Um, or it's going to be up on the screen. So if, if you've got your Bible on your phone and you don't want to get distracted, just you can just follow on the screen if you'd like. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 10. It's a passage about living and serving well. I think that if you wanted to write a a heading for what the passage is about, this is what you could call it, live and serve well. So Paul's writing to Timothy, right? And I think if you gave this passage a heading, this is a worthy candidate, live and serve well. And what I want to do this morning is not, um, I don't know what Dave normally does or whoever preaches here normally does, presumably normally read through the passage and then pull out a couple of Uh, points uh, that we can reflect on and apply and so forth. Um, What I want to do this morning, rather than that, is not read through the whole passage straight off. I want to read through it section by section, in three sections, and then um, after I read a couple of verses, we'll pause and just uh, see how it applies, particularly to missions, but also how it applies to us here at Brackenridge. Um, So there's not kind of three or four or two memorable points this morning, so to speak. I want to share the the text in three sections and pull out some points, if you like, some thoughts for missions and for us here at Bracket. Does that make sense? Okay, it's about 10 people who know where we're going, so that's enough for me. Let's keep going. Uh, Let's go to the next slide. Um, Verses 1 to 2, 2 Timothy, verses 1 to 2. <clears throat> you then, my son, yeah, I'll read it here, my eyes, oh, I'm going to need glasses soon, <sighs> reaching that stage in life, I have been making fun of my wife, which I shouldn't do, <laughs> confession time, because she's just needed glasses, and I've been keeping it hidden that I'm actually, anyway, <laughs> you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So, let's just get what these verses are saying. Verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So, why, why is he saying you then? Like, what's going on here? In the verses just before this, uh, Paul describes three people. Two of them deserted him. Two of them, I don't know how to pronounce their names in English, Phygelus and Hermogenes, maybe that'll do, Uh, I don't know. Uh, They deserted Paul, we don't know why they deserted him, Uh, we don't know anything about them. Uh, So anyway, there were two people who deserted Paul, perhaps they deserted him because they were ashamed of him, because Paul talks a lot about being ashamed of him in chapter 1, or perhaps they deserted him because Paul was imprisoned and they don't want to be persecuted, we don't know. There were two important disciples who deserted Paul. But then also there's one other person described just before this passage called Onesimus, who didn't desert Paul. And in fact, he's a faithful supporter of Paul's ministry. And so Paul's just been describing three people, two of them dodgy, one of them awesome. And he's saying, now you, Timothy, how are you going to live? And this is what you have to do. You, don't be like Phygelus or Hermogenes, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. His grace is enough for you to minister and serve well each day. Like Onesimus, be like him, be like me as I follow Christ. Be strong in the grace of Jesus. And then, after that, verse 2, Paul passes on his his multiplying strategy. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. And so Paul, as we know, he's got this huge teaching ministry, right? And he's, his teaching ministry focuses on some foundational truths, and he's now thinking about the end. In all likelihood, 2 Timothy is his last letter, we see in chapter 4, verse 6, I think it is, he's, he's already thinking that he's going to die. My life is getting poured out like a drink offering. I'm preparing for the end. And he knows he's going to die. 
And so as he writes this, he's thinking about, he's thinking strategically, how am I going to make sure that these truths that I've been teaching and proclaiming, how am I going to make sure that they're going out continually after I die? And this is his strategy. You, Timothy, you've heard them. Now, teach them, pass them on, and trust them to not just anyone, to reliable people who will then teach them to others, etc., etc., etc. This multiplying strategy. We see this, yeah, you can see it up there on the screen, a picture of it. We, we, we see this kind of strategy used all the time in missional circles. Um, could give you so many examples of this, so many. Um, but the one I want to share, I, I was reminded this week about church planting movements. I don't know if you've heard of church planting movements. They're pretty self-explanatory. It's where you got, so church planting movements. But to give you the definition that we use in Indonesia, a church planting movement is where you've got an indigenous church that is planting another, they're, they're planting churches right, within a given people group or a given geographic area. And it becomes a movement when you've got at least four generations of churches being planted. So you've got one church that's planting a couple of others, and one of those is planting a couple of others, and one of those is planting a couple of others. Once we get to four generations, we call it a movement, right? I was reminded of that because earlier this week, I was chatting to a friend of mine, a, a, a worker in Indonesia, Indonesian fellow, and his, his job is, what an amazing job it is, he gets to work with all different mission organizations and uh, denominations and so on to kind of see um, what's happening on the ground to kind of inform other mobs like Joshua Project. And like, it's his job to um, summarize, if you like, all of the ministry that's happening on the ground. And he was telling me that right now, in Indonesia, there is round about 100 church planting movements, CPMs, happening. So not just new churches. We're talking movements of churches. That's amazing. Like, it's amazing. And they're happening not just in a couple of people groups where you might have a huge people group and there's a church planting movement over here, church planting movement over here. They're happening in around about 40 unreached people groups which is huge. Maybe that doesn't mean much to you, but for me, that's really encouraging. This is a huge thing that's happening in Indonesia at the moment. Lots of people coming to the Lord. Um, it's what we want to see. The, the multiplying principle, Paul's multiplying principle here is happening on the ground. There are people who uh, teach, who share the gospel, and they teach it clearly to others who are then able to go and teach it themselves. Now, when we talk about this kind of church planting thing, just so you're aware, so you've got the right picture in your head, uh, a, a church plant is frequently not the size of a church here or whatever. One organization, they have their cut off at 12 people. Like you, you, you start a congregation, once you reach 12 people, we're going to start another one. So it's, it's very different to here. But there's a lot of stuff happening because people are following this 2 Timothy 2.2 principle. Entrust gospel truths to reliable people who will then pass them on to others. And I was thinking then about how it might apply to us here at Bracken Ridge. And really, there's, there's the direct application where the question here is, how are we doing this? Are we doing this well? Can we do it better, etc.? How are we here entrusting gospel truths to reliable, gifted people who are then going to teach them on themselves well? And I don't know if that, I presume it's happening well, but the question can perhaps be reflected on, can we do it better? But I was also thinking that there's an implicit question here which is, am I someone who could be described as a reliable, trust? am I someone who is teachable? Like when Paul was writing this to Timothy, and so Timothy's looking at the congregation or perhaps a couple of congregations in Ephesus, and he's going, okay, well, who are the reliable people here? 
Would he have been looking at me? Would he have been looking at you and straight away going, this is a reliable, teachable person who I'm going to entrust the truths of the gospel to and then entrust them to go and share it amongst others? And it's actually a, a question that's worth reflecting on because there are, there are frequently times when, when we are not teachable. Right? It could be, I mean, the obvious reason why we don't, why we're not teachable is, is when pride gets in the way and we think we know it all already or whatever. Um, or sometimes we're not teachable. We can't be described as a teachable, reliable person because perhaps uh, we're too busy. There's right? too much going on. Um, or there's at times, you know, there are lovely Christian people who are lazy, <laughs> and more interested in the things of the world, more interested in YouTube than being a teachable, reliable gospel worker. And so it's worth reflecting on this and going, am I so... Like, and I know that we can always say, well, of course you can be more teachable, you can be more reliable, etc. It's like when someone up the front says, are you praying enough? And you can never say yes. Like, the question here is not, please hear me right, the question here is not, are we teachable enough? Are we reliable enough? Because we can never say yes to that. But there is a line, right? Paul is writing to Timothy here saying, there are people who are reliable and teachable and trust the gospel to them. And so the question, one question that's worth reflecting on from this passage is, if Timothy were looking at me, what would he say? Like, am I a teachable, reliable person? Or not? And if not, why not? It's perhaps worth reflecting on and bringing before the Lord. Let's keep going anyway. Verse 3 to 7. Let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, let's just read them. Verse 3 to 7. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus... No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. So here we've got three pictures of the Christian life. Soldier, athlete, farmer, and they're all really challenging. First one, picture of a soldier, right? Serving his commanding officer. The picture is we're in a war, right? Soldiers are there because of the likelihood of war. And our commanding officer of Jesus, our commanding officer is Jesus. And so the point here, Timothy's Paul's point to Timothy is, let's not get caught up in civilian affairs. We are not civilians, people of the world. We are soldiers serving under our commander, Jesus. And when you do the verse 7 thing and reflect on this, this is really challenging. It massively affects how you spend your money, for example. Maybe you have this wartime mindset. It affects how you approach relationships. It affects how you spend your time, your free time. It affects everything. That's the first picture. The second picture is of an athlete who lives a dedicated life, who foregoes the easy life, the comfortable life, and trains him or herself in whatever discipline it is they're training themselves in, and who competes according to the rules. Now, why does it say competes according to the rules? Well, because when you're involved in any kind of sport, there's rules. Uh, I've been enjoying rugby league while I've been back. There are rules in rugby league. Okay, moving on. And there's also, <laughs> there's also the other reason perhaps... Uh, why Paul mentions rules here is because in, in the first century, there are all these, all these different sports competitions, right? Some of them you had to sign to say that you'd trained for a certain amount of time before you competed in 
the rules. At the Olympics, for example, you had to sign to say that you'd been training consistently for 10 months before you were allowed to train. And so those are the, there's rules involved in, in being an, a dedicated athlete. And of course, there's rules for the training that we're involved in as well. What are the, what are the rules that we have? It's God's will. It's, it's the Bible. And what is it that we're training ourselves in? Well, it's not a marathon. Not a literal marathon anyway. We're training to be faithful disciples of Christ, to live and to serve well. I presume that when Timothy read this, he would have been immediately reminded of Paul's first letter to him, chapter 4, where Paul says, train yourself to be godly. We know that passage, yeah? Physical training is of some value, but godliness is value for all things. Train yourself to be... So the training that we're called to be involved, to be dedicated to is godliness, holiness. Athletes getting up early, choosing what they eat, blah, blah, blah. Going hard at it. For us, our training is in godliness, holiness. And so... The point here, I think Paul's point is, reflect on this, how are we being dedicated, disciplined, trainees, if you like, in godliness, in holiness? Are we dedicated to, are we disciplined in this? And then the final picture, there's the hardworking farmer who should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Now, that's an interesting picture because it's not immediately clear. I think we know what a hardworking farmer looks like, so to speak. But the, the first to share in the crops, what does it say? First to receive a share of the crops. That's not immediately obvious what he's talking about in regards to what, what, is, what are the crops here. Um, so anyway, I was looking at different commentaries on this and there's different views among scholars on, on this. Some people think the crops or a share in the crops are honor or recognition in the church, like work as a hardworking farmer so that you'll get first share in honor or recognition in the church. That sounds a bit weird to me, but anyway, some people think that's it. Some people think it means a salary. Other people think it's, it's some kind of spiritual reward for God, maybe in this life, maybe eschatological in the last day. Maybe it's holiness, like work hard, Timothy, and you'll be the first to get a share in holiness, like you'll grow in holiness more than others. Maybe it means converts, um, because yeah, the whole relationship between crops and harvest, Jesus is the Lord of the harvest, and let's call on the Lord of the harvest. Anyway, I don't know if it matters that much. Because if you, if you think on it, the point of the picture remains the same regardless. Namely, work hard. And there is reward. It's worth it. Work hard. So anyway, there's three pictures of different, three metaphors, if you like, of three different types of people. And the point of all of them is to live disciplined, hardworking, focused lives. And Paul says, verse 7, reflect on these. Think about them, and the Lord will give you insight. And so, homework this week, Brackenridge. Think on these. Reflect on them. What does it mean to be a hardworking soldier, hardworking farmer, a dedicated athlete, a disciplined person? What does it mean? I was thinking on these as I was preparing for this, and I was reminded of the college where, um, where I'm teaching. So we, we kind of go a bit overboard with this. We try to build discipline into the lives of our students. So let me give you a picture of what a typical day in the life of a, an undergraduate student looks like. They live on the campus. They sleep for not long enough. Then at 5 a.m., it's a big bell that rings. They have to be out of bed. And down there doing their uh, chores, sweeping, cleaning, etc. 5 a.m. And then a, mole, a roll is marked. You have to do it, right? 
Then straight after that, usually at about 5.20 or so, it's personal devotions time. And you spend time uh, in God's Word, prayer and so forth. Six o'clock, breakfast. Then after breakfast, get yourself ready for the day. Clean your teeth. I'm trying to convince people to clean their teeth. Clean your teeth. And then 7.30, chapel. Right? Chapel till 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock, classes. Classes until 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock is lunch. Then 2 o'clock, classes again. Classes finish at either two or uh, finish at either four or five o'clock. Then after that, you get a brief break. We we'll have a shower. Then dinner, six o'clock, seven o'clock. There's there's things different nights of the week. Could be prayer meetings. Could be small groups. Could be another worship service. And then ten o'clock. Uh, that's until nine o'clock. Then you get yourself ready for bed. Ten o'clock. Lights off. It has to be lights off. And then the next day, you get it up and do it. Get up and do it again. And that's every day. Saturdays and Sundays, you still have to get up early and go to bed at the right time and so on. But you also have to be going to church twice a day on Sunday and Saturday. You, you know, hopefully day of rest. But they're not very good at that. Um, why do we do this? The reason why we are doing this is not because we want to build legalism in. You know, you tell people and they're like, oh, you know, you're just going to breed all these legalistic people. Let's, if you're sitting in classes for hours and hours every day where the gospel is being taught clearly, I can't see that happening. What we're wanting to see happen is students know what it means to live disciplined lives. Like soldiers. So that then when they're sent back to wherever it is that they're going to serve, they serve well. Disciplined, pouring out their lives for the sake of Christ. So anyway, let's live disciplined lives. Brackenridge with Jesus as our leader. I could talk on that for a long time, but let's keep going. Last part of the passage, uh, verses 8 to 10. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. In the original language, these three sentences, uh, three uh, verses are one sentence. It's, this is one big thought, but for the sake of clarity, we'll just go through it bit by bit. The first bit, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel. So the good news that Paul, you want to sum up the gospels, all different ways that Paul does it, this is one way he does it. Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. It's the good news that Paul preached, centered on Jesus, the Messiah. Descended from David, it's like a shorthand way of saying he is the Messiah. He fulfilled the Davidic promise, uh, all the promises about a descendant from David, including the Davidic promise that you see in 2 Samuel 7, for example, that there's a coming king and so forth. He's the Messiah who came to redeem God's people and who was raised from the dead which is, again, a deep, rich truth which encapsulates so much, right? Jesus being raised from the dead vindicates, it validates his ministry. It proves that the Father is satisfied with what Jesus did. Jesus' work is enough. And his being raised proves the victory over the final enemy, death, so sin, Satan, death, all defeated, which is amazing news for us as his followers. I mean, death is not the end. We're here on earth for a few moments and then with the Lord forever. And so Paul says, remember this good news that I've been preaching. Remember it. Now, why does he say remember it? I don't think it's because Timothy had, what do we call it? Early onset Alzheimer's or whatever. Is that what you call it? Where you forget things? I don't think it was because Timothy was forgetful. <clears throat> He says, remember the gospel, I think for a few reasons. 
One of them is, in Ephesus, there was a lot of false teaching going on, right? And so, uh, remember the gospel is, it's another way of saying, guard the good deposit, which he says in chapter 1. Guard the gospel. Entrust it to reliable people. We want to make sure that the gospel is is guarded well, it's safeguarded against all this false teaching against these other Gospels. Remember the Gospel. This is that, right? Safeguarded against false teaching. There's also, remember the Gospel, because he wants this Gospel to be the, at the forefront of Timothy's teaching and preaching ministry. Kind of like in chapter 4, verse 2, right? There's that well-known text, preach the word, Timothy. And the word for the record in the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, uh, Titus, is almost always a synonym for the gospel. Preach the gospel, Timothy. Right? Have this at the forefront of your teaching, preaching ministry. And in fact, that really fits with the context here for the record because Paul after this says, this is why I'm in prison, for sharing the gospel. So remember the gospel in your ministry, like make this at the forefront of it, Timothy. Share it. Remember it. Don't get so caught up in all these other ministries that you forget what you're here for. Preach the gospel. Third one. It could also mean remember the gospel. I think it means all of them for the record. Remember the gospel in the sense that... um, in your own life, Timothy, don't fall into this, in this default position that we all have of presuming that God is angry with me or disappointed in me or something like that, because that's not the gospel. The gospel is right now, because of Jesus, I'm all right, because I put my faith in Him, repented, right now I am righteous in His sight. I am forgiven. I am already saved. Eternal life is mine forever. Remember that, Timothy. Live in grace, verse 1. Remember the gospel. So this is a big, multifaceted thing. Remember the gospel. Let's keep going. Getting excited. For which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Ah, Paul's, he's just a champion, isn't he? He wrote at least five letters from prison, as far as we know, right? This is... This is one of them. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, verse 10, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I'm willing to go through whatever for the sake of God's people, for the sake of sharing the gospel with and building up God's people. A couple of months ago, uh, shortly before we came back to Australia, in, at the start of February, um, we ran a missions festival at our college, and because I've been there for a few years now, uh, we made it compulsory for the undergraduates. I can do that now. Um, anyway, ran it across three days, and the aim of this missions festival was to raise awareness amongst the students about the need to share the good news with people outside your own people group, with unreached people group, because uh, as much as we might look at Indonesia and go, there's all these different unreached people groups, of course Indonesian Christians should be sharing the good news with unreached peoples. That's not the way that Indonesian believers often think about evangelism. They often think about doing evangelism within their own people group. And so we were trying to raise awareness about the need to be sharing the good news with people outside your own people group, right? So uh, we did that for a few days, and we, we spent a lot of time talking about challenges for mission, and Amy was awesome. She, like, cooked up international foods, uh, which meant they had to re- eat something other than rice, which was good. <laughs> and anyway, as part of this, um, as of this conference, we brought in some Indonesian missionaries, so Indonesian believers, right, who are doing mission work amongst unreached peoples themselves. Some of them have been doing this kind of work for 30 plus years. Some of them are just, you know, they're one or two years out of our college. But we wanted to bring them in so that they could share their experiences with the student body about what it's like on the ground if you do this, right? What it's, because our hope is that, my hope was, just so you know, my hope was that we'd have like 10 of our students 
um, put their hands up and say, I want to serve as a full-time missionary to unreached peoples. I want to do this. Have at least 10. And the rest of them who are going to serve as pastors or teachers or something like that, that wherever it is that they end up serving, that they would do it with an outward focus. So that was kind of the hope behind it. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, three people understand. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Um, so that was the hope behind it. Like I said, we got in these, um, these different Indonesian uh, missionaries to share about their experiences. And one of the things that they spoke a lot about was the difficulties they faced. Um, they're oftentimes shunned by the community, so they're lonely, which is really hard in a community kind of culture. They're poor. Um, Indonesian missionaries, some of them have been, like some of the people who came, they've been imprisoned for their faith. Some of them have, have suffered all sorts of, all sorts of things. I mean, violence, I mean, you name it, these guys go through it. They do it tough. And of course, our students know this. Uh, violence against believers is not that uncommon, particularly in our city, right? Just a year ago, we had a suicide bombing really close to our campus. Our daughter was, she heard the big bang. She's like, Daddy, what's going on? And like this, it's not uncommon for church buildings to be firebombed. Hey, persecution against believers, particularly believers who want to share their faith, it's not that uncommon. So anyway, at this missions festival, what, like I say, what we're wanting to do is call these students to share the good news, to come and suffer. The focus is not on suffering. The focus is on sharing the gospel. But if it means suffering, let it happen. We want to see the name of Jesus go out, right? And like I say, we were praying that we would have 10 people put their hands up and say they want to become full-time missionary amongst unreached peoples. We had 80 students put their hands up and say they want to pour out their lives as missionaries. That's amazing. Can you imagine that what's going to... Anyway, they know they will suffer. They know it. They are willing to endure everything for the sake of the elect, God's people, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And this is the call of God on all of our lives. To be prepared to suffer anything for the sake of seeing God's people get the gospel, be built up in the gospel for the sake of the kingdom, even if it's hard. So let's do it well. Amen? Last slide. I'm almost done. Uh, like I said at the beginning, if you want to give this passage a title, I think you could uh, say that Paul's saying to Timothy, live and serve well. Timothy, don't waste your life, right? Live well, serve well. Live in grace, verse 1, and multiply your ministry. And as you do it, live like a soldier who obeys his commanding officer. Live like an athlete who's disciplined, dedicated, Live like a hard-working farmer. If you know anything about farmers, hard-working ones, it's a lot of time spent. And in the midst of it all, in the midst of all of this, the discipline, the hard work, remember the gospel. Remember the gospel. Live and serve well. A couple of days ago, two days ago, I was reminded of a poem by a missionary, I want to finish with this, a, a British missionary uh, in heaven called C.T. Studd. You may have heard of him. It's a long poem, and I don't want to read it all, and it's old English, so I hope you'll excuse that. But um, I, I just want to read a couple of stanzas because I think it in, encapsulates um, what, what some of what Paul was, was saying to Timothy through this passage. So I'll just read a couple of stanzas, and then we'll pray, and we're done. Um, only one life twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. I'll let my love with fervor burn, and from the world let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life 
act will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life. Yes, only one. So let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, "Twas worth it all. Only one life. T'will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, the word uh, in this passage and the call, the challenge it is to us to live and serve well. And Father, there's lots and lots and lots of things that we've talked about this morning. Um, and uh, you meet us where we are and you speak to each of us individually. And so, Father, we pray that what it is that you're wanting to say to each of us this morning, Father, help us to keep hearing it, keep reflecting on it, and to respond well. And Father, we pray this week you'd give each of us special insight on what it means to live as a soldier under Jesus. What it means to live as a dedicated athlete training according to the rules. What it means to live as a hard-working farmer who will be rewarded. And Father, we also pray that throughout all of it, you'd help each of us to remember well the gospel in our ministries, in our lives, in our doubts. Father, we pray that you'd um, yeah, help us as we continue to reflect on this to hear your voice with such clarity. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.